thank you for joining us for this webinar, Normal Neonatal Development. In this webinar, Revival's Director of Veterinary Services, Dr. Marty Greer, will be sharing her knowledge. Dr. Greer has more than 40 years experience in veterinary medicine with special interests in canine reproduction and pediatrics. She received her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from Iowa State University in 1981, and she has served as Revival's Director of Veterinary Services since 2019. So thanks for joining us today, Dr. Greer. So today we're primarily going to talk about normal puppy development because there's a lot of normal. And as they taught us in veterinary school, you can't know abnormal until you know normal. So do you really understand how normal puppies development develop, what their vet development should look like? And I think that's really important. And if you have a concern, do you know how to verbalize that and explain it to your veterinarian or their veterinary team? Because it can be really hard to just call and say, I, I don't know, it just doesn't seem right. <clears throat> whether it's your pregnant dog or whether it's your puppies, newborns or a little bit older, the better you can compare to normal and abnormal and the better you can define this when you call or email your vet clinic and say, I think I need help, the better chances are that they can give you the right information, get you in at the time that they need to get you in and give you the help you need. So a normal newborn puppy at birth should be alert and able to crawl. Now, whether it's born by C-section or whether it's born by vaginal birth, either way, they should come out of the uterus alert, crying, um, being able to breathe comfortably and crawling around, kind of looking for where they're supposed to be. If you have a puppy that's crying incessantly, and it's not just a little fussy, but it's really crying, you want to consider it first to be chilled and hungry. So those are the first things that I want you to do is get the puppy warm. If it's appropriate, warm it up, take its temperature first, slowly warm the puppy. The general rule of thumb is to not warm it more than one degree an hour. So if your puppy's at 92 degrees, you don't want them at 96 in an hour. You want to bring that up slowly. And then once they're warm, you want to make sure that they're fed. Those are the two most common things that we see causing a puppy to be crying and in distress. Once we get to the point of having them warm and fed, if they're still not well, if they're still crying, if they're still not well, then at our troubled newborn discussion, we're going to go through the causes of illness and some of the things that you can do about it. <clears throat> so we're going to start with the nervous system. I think that's an important place to begin. A normal puppy should be able to right itself. In other words, get its feet underneath its belly, not laying on its side or on its back. It should be able to right itself. It should be able to root, which means if you hold your fingers in a circle, the puppy should seek out a side that it would look for a nipple. So that's normal rooting reflex. Puppies should be able to do that at birth. So they should be seeking a nipple by turning their head side to side in that little circle. And they should have a withdrawal reflex, meaning that if you pinch their toe or their tails, they should feel it and they should pull back. Puppies should also be able to suckle as soon as they're born or shortly thereafter. And that should be present as a reflex until they're about three weeks old. Now, there was an article written <clears throat> in bovine medicine, in uh, dairy cattle primarily, that said that a calf should be able to suckle. And if it suckles well, in other words, nurses well on the nipple, that it has a better chance of survival. I thought it was interesting that they needed a study to tell us that a calf that could eat would be better likely to survive. It seems obvious, but those reflexes are things that you can very easily check at home. Writing, rooting, withdrawal, and suckling should all be present as soon as the puppy is born. And then tactile, anal, and urinary reflexes, again, you should, uh, as soon as you touch them, they should start to defecate and urinate appropriately. And we'll talk about how to collect those samples. The other interesting things are, and these are pictures that I took off the internet. I did not actually hold the puppies in these positions, but this is a normal reflex is that until the puppies are four days old, they should have flexor dominance, meaning with, with the kind of support that's shown in this picture, they should flex their head down and flex um, their limbs in. And then after day four, they start to extend or they start to get longer or taller when you hold them in that position. So it looks a little weird. Like I said, I did not take these photographs. So please don't call me and say you're being horrible to your puppies. Um, this is what a normal reflex should look like. And you can see that this is just a person that's demonstrating those reflexes. It was just a brief hold. Now the nervous system in a puppy develops much more slowly than it does in some of our farm animals. Our calves, our baby pigs, um, our goats, our sheep, they're born eyes open, ready to run within an hour. And if they don't, they're prey, they don't survive. Just like animals in the wild, if they're not able to get up and run, there's a reason for that. Um, those, those babies aren't gonna have a good chance of survival. So by comparison, 
our puppies are pretty slow in developing. They don't do some of these things until they're several weeks old. They don't open their eyes until they're 10 to 14 days old. They don't run until they're two or three or four weeks old. They, they just don't. And there's a reason that a lot of animals, wild animals and our domestic animals go into labor just before a storm. When there's a barometric pressure drop, just before the big snowstorm, just before the big rainstorm, just before the hurricanes, the tornadoes, whatever kind of weather is coming, a lot of babies are born because the moms go into labor just before that. And it's felt that evolutionarily that if you had your baby during a storm, that yes, it could get wet and cold. But on the other hand, the animals that are going to look for your babies as prey animals, as dinner, are also going to be hunkered down someplace. So they're not as likely to get out and about and be looking for your babies. Now, dogs are different than a lot of the species because they have litters and they have to leave them when they go out to hunt. They can't take them along for the first several weeks to months. So they have to hide them in a den. And so these puppies are born with their eyes closed. They don't have good neurologic function at this point, And they sleep 90% of the time. When they sleep, it is normal for them to twitch. That twitching motion is absolutely normal. That is not a seizure. They should be able to walk by day 21. And neonates should be able to start to stand by 10 days if you're a kitten and by 14 days if you're a puppy. Smaller puppies tend to stand up a little faster than those bigger, heavier puppies. Now, reflexes in some ways, because they're a delayed development, are lacking. Puppies cannot shiver until they're about three weeks old. So our puppies need auxiliary heat. Having them at just 70 degrees or 68 degrees in our homes is not warm enough for puppies. They need to be kept warmer. They lose a lot of body heat when they're first born. They're wet. The water evaporate, evaporates quickly. They chill. So it's important that we know that they can't shiver. We can't um, expect them to keep themselves warm. So we have to heat, heat them. We have to give them additional heat. And I prefer, and we've talked about this before, the heat from underneath, not the heat from above. I don't like heat lamps. I do like the heating nests, like the whelping nests that heat from underneath. Uh, puppies do not gag. So if you're trying to feed with an eyedropper, um, or a syringe without the appropriate kind of nipple on it where they have to suckle on it, they may not be able to gag. And so they may aspirate fluid and they cannot urinate and defecate without stimulation for the first 10 to 14 days. So all those things need to be taken into account when you're um, taking care of your babies. Waking and sleeping patterns, like I said, they sleep about 90% of the time. They don't normally sleep in such an uh, organized pattern as you see here, but it is kind of a fun little picture. <clears throat> And I'm going to tell you that the three things that you should really be monitoring the closest at home are going to be their body temperature, their urine color, and their body weight. So these are pretty simple to do, but a lot of people are reluctant to do some of these things. So I took some video. This is a puppy that's here for a tail doc. So you can see that there's a clipper and some hair shaved, um, but <clears throat> essentially you take a rectal thermometer, you put Vaseline on it, you slide it into the puppy's rectum and you hold it in the rectum until the beep goes off and tells you that the thermometer is done reading. It is any size puppy can accommodate a thermometer. So get one of the fast di uh, digital thermometers that go into the rectum. The shake them down kinds are pretty uh, long until they actually get to a temperature that you can read. So take a temperature with a digital thermometer. It's very quick. It's very easy. It's not difficult to do. Just lubricate it well and put it in. You want to make sure that the puppy's rectal temperature is at least 96 degrees before you initiate feeding. So it's very important that you're temping these puppies if you're supplemental feeding. Number two is to check their hydration. And this is a uh, not so sophisticated system. It requires a cotton ball. As you can see, my staff does this many, many times a day. You can see the stack of cotton balls on the counter. And they just hold the puppy over a waste basket because they know this puppy is going to urinate more than what one cotton ball will hold. And so by simply stimulating the puppy to urinate and defecate, you can check the color of the urine and the urine should be a very, very pale yellow on the cotton ball. This puppy is going to have darker urine than I'd like. That is a darker color. So that's a puppy that could use additional feeding either by nursing more or by um, having a bottle feeding. This is a fairly large litter. So we had this owner start to supplement feeding with a bottle. And then um, weighing, of course, is also relatively simple. I like the scales that um, will do both uh, digital in um, grams and in ounces. So you just put the puppy on the platform and I like the scales that toggle back and forth. Ounces are what most th people think of here in the United States. You think in ounces, you think your puppy is 14 ounces. It's almost a pound when it's born. That's easy to calculate. 
The advantage to grams is that smaller incremental changes will be noted earlier if you're measuring in grams than in ounces. Ounces, there's only 16 divisions in a pound, but grams, there's 454 in a pound. So you can see much smaller changes either on the way up or on the way down. So if you have a puppy that you're not sure is uh, adequately nursing and you're thinking maybe I should supplement or maybe the puppy's not gaining as well as it should be, measure in grams, keep a record of it. And it's very simple to just keep a notebook um, with the column for the temperature, a column for the weight, a column for the urine color, and then track at least twice a day what your puppy's weights are, what their temperatures are, what their urine color is. And you'll pick up really early changes in things that are happening that you won't pick up by just observing the puppies by peering over the whelping box side. So make sure that you're doing those three parameters. They're very easy to check. They're simple, doesn't take expensive equipment. A thermometer is under $10. A scale can be around 20 to 30. And those tools will be life-saving for your puppies. So make sure that you're getting enough supplementation in these guys. If they're dehydrated, if they're not gaining weight the way they should be, then start your bottle feeding or tube feeding. Active learning starts at three weeks of age for puppies and their social period starts at around four weeks and typically ends by about eight. So you have a very small window of time to get these puppies adequately socialized. And remember we did environmental enrichment in one of the previous, uh, one of these that we did in November. So you can look back and look at some of the things that we taught during that. It's absolutely normal for puppies to dream sleep and to twitch when they're sleeping. And it's absolutely normal for puppies to have the hiccups frequently. So those are not reason for concern. It's really pretty cute when they do it. So don't be concerned about either of those. <clears throat> Next, I want to talk about the oral cavity and the GI tract. And those kind of go hand in hand because what goes in the mouth ends up coming through. The oral cavity should be a pink color, a nice bright pink like this puppy's tongue. Um, it should be moist if it's dry um, or if the puppy's tongue doesn't seem the right color, then you may have a puppy that's not getting enough oxygen or not hydrated enough. Um, and remember hydration, you can't pull up the skin on the back of a puppy's neck and check hydration like you can in an adult dog. Puppies don't have the amount of body fat that adult dogs have. So you need to look at urine color. You need to look at the oral cavity and see if they're adequately um, being hydrated. The puppy's mouth should be a little bit redder when the puppy's either crying or nursing because of blood flow. If you see sores in the mouth, and if you're looking at the mouth, you'll see them. You may have those either because there's a bacterial infection or a viral infection like herpes. So if you have a sick puppy, be sure that you check the oral cavity for wetness, for the color, and for any signs of sores. Now, unfortunately, cleft palates are one of the most common defects that we see. I have both cleft palates and cleft uh, nasal passages in these photos. Uh, the first puppy on the left you can see has two cleft nasal passages. Uh, those can be relatively easily fixed as long as the puppy doesn't also have a cleft palate. Now, there are people who really focus on saving these puppies with cleft palates. Many of our owners do not. Um, oftentimes, puppies with cleft palates have additional defects, so sometimes trying to save them can be more than frustrating. It can be just downright heartbreaking, so it's not for everybody to save them. If they do have a cleft, they're going to need to have a surgical procedure done. Um, I've had people say full cleft. I've never seen a partial cleft. It's really, if there's a cleft, it's going to be a cleft. It's pretty obvious. If you're not sure, either get a flashlight or if you're at the vet clinic, get an otoscope, the thing you look in ears with, and get a good look because in dimly light rooms, you can sometimes miss these. Now at our C-sections, my staff is trained that as they're taking the puppy from the doctor and walking away with it, starting to suction, they're flipping the mouth open and checking for a cleft immediately. Oftentimes we'll have a puppy that comes out with a defect on its leg or it's really small, something else looks like it's wrong with it. And those are puppies that have clefts. So before you um, really beat yourself up about losing a puppy or about um, a puppy that just doesn't seem to be thriving, check with a flashlight, see if there's a cleft, uh, last week, I got a phone call from a client that ended up with two in a litter. So it's it's really heart-wrenching when those things happen. She had never seen one before. So the first thing I tell people when they're having a puppy not thrive is to look for a cleft. This is another example of a cleft palate puppy. This is a little bit of an older puppy. And you can see in the picture with the mouth open where the cleft is. And you can see there's food stuck up in that palate. So that's why these need to be fixed surgically. Typically, the dental departments at the universities and dental um, specialists are now putting acrylic plates in the roof of the mouth to cover that defect instead of trying to suture it closed. So it is a fairly expensive surgery. And for some people, that's appropriate for other people. Um, or if the puppy has additional defects, sometimes just letting the puppy go is the best option. Left lips, on the other hand, are 
also fairly common, but they're pretty easy to fix surgically. Usually one surgical repair will take care of it. So they are not difficult to fix. And if the puppy doesn't have an associated other defect, they can go on to live pretty close to normal lives. Teething, very important that we're aware of when our dogs are teething. It is normal for puppies to teethe. Sometimes you'll find blood on things if they're chewing on um, fabric or toys or if some of those things, you'll see that there's blood, but that's normal. They should start teething when they're about four months old. The toy puppies tend to teethe a little bit more delayed than the other breeds of dogs. So the little tiny dogs may start at five or five and a half months, but the average dog is going to teethe at around four. Um, it is normal for them to lose their their all their baby teeth starting in the middle of the top with the maxillary teeth, and then it marches along so that they start at four months by five to five and a half months, their canines, the big fang teeth have been replaced by adults. Um, and then um, they go on to finish up by getting all their premolars and molars in. Complete replacement should take place by six months of age. If the puppy has a retained tooth, instead of having that tooth fall out when the uh, adult tooth comes in, sometimes we have to have those teeth extracted. It's not uncommon for that, especially in the toy breeds. So don't be surprised if that's the case. And if the dog is put under anesthesia for a spay or neuter, then that's a great time to remove those additional teeth. The teeth should look like this when they're well aligned in the average dog. But the picture on the right shows a breaking, uh, breaking nathic puppy. And that's a normal thing for a neonate to have. In other words, on a neonatal puppy, the very young ones, the lower jaw sticks out further that's normal. That's the way the puppy can really get a good hold of the nipple and nurse. If the puppy has a short lower jaw, be looking for a cleft palate or some other defect because something is wrong, but their lower jaw should jut out a little bit when they're newborns. And then as they grow, the upper jaw catches up and it grows into a position so that the adult incisor teeth on the left-hand side of this picture come in in front of the lower incisors and then the lower canine tooth should come in in front of the upper. So that's what a normal bite should look. And then if you look at the side bite, I love this picture because it shows all of the pictures. It shows the incisors at the front lined up correctly. It shows the canines in the correct position. And then you can see that the molars and the premolars alternate like a, like a saw blade. So they don't line up on top of each other. They line up adjacent to each other. If we have a puppy with a short lower jaw, that's called, or, or base narrow, in other words, the narrow, the lower jaw is too narrow, then instead of the canine tooth being in front, as it should be, you can see in this picture that the canine tooth falls behind and oftentimes is too narrow. And then it punctures these holes into the roof of the mouth. So these puncture wounds are from the lower uh, incisors hitting, or the lower canine teeth hitting the upper palate. This can be very uncomfortable for the dog. So sometimes these teeth neither need to be bonded so that they're um, blunted, or they can be extracted depending on the, the age of the dog and what the veterinary dentist determines should be done. So be aware that base narrow is a genetic de deformity that we see commonly in dogs. And I've had clients with this happen in an, sometimes in an entire litter. And if they breed away from it, then they will stop having puppies with that kind of a defect. Um, it isn't life-threatening, but it is expensive to fix. And you don't want people that are buying your puppies to have to have expensive dental care as soon as they get a new dog. The GI tract, the intestinal tract should be born sterile. So when the puppy first has a stool, if you tried to culture it, nothing should grow. But very quickly, it colonizes with bacteria from the environment, from the dam. So it's not uncommon for them to have uh, bacteria entering the GI tract as they are nursing. Using a probiotic when they're really young can be preventive. It can also be done if the puppy is on antibiotics. Now we don't routinely put puppies on antibiotics, but if your puppy is put on an antibiotic by your veterinarian, then you should also include a probiotic to make sure that the right bacteria are present in the GI tract to prevent diarrhea. Uh, we have a new product called Breeders Ed Nurture Flora, and it is labeled for puppies from birth to three months of age. It comes in a tube like some of our other products and it's pretty sticky. So it's hard to get into a feeding tube with formula, but it's pretty easy to just dab on the tongue or the roof of the mouth and then the puppy will swallow it. Um, it's kind of like a molasses base. So it's, it's very sticky. The stool um, should, they should be passing meconium, which is the first fetal stool that should be passed in the first 48 hours. Um, it's not unusual to see that if a puppy is born with meconium in their fetal membranes, there are times that your veterinarian may want to put them on an antibiotic to prevent them from developing aspiration pneumonia. A normal neonatal stool should be pasty, yellow, and seedy. It should have little seed looking things in it. That's absolutely normal. 
oftentimes you never see it because the dam is cleaning up after the puppies. But if you see that yellow CD looking stool, that's normal stool. Do not get excited. That is not diarrhea. And then by the time the puppies are ready to wean, their stools are starting to become formed enough that you can pick them up. Initially, puppies cannot urinate and defecate on their own, so their mothers have to stimulate them for the first 18 to 21 days. If you have a dam that cannot do so because she's sick or because there's something else going on, then make sure that you're stimulating at each feeding so the puppies don't have any backup, any constipation. If you see yellow or yellow watery stools or green watery stools, that may mean that the puppy's getting too much to eat, so you may have to back off a little bit. If the stools are foamy and bright yellow, it may be canine herpes. If they're blood tinged, the puppy may have either a bacterial infection or coccidia, and they can get coccidia really young. I've had them in my own dogs as early as 14 days of age. If the dam had coccidia and she brought it in on her pants or on her feet, then those puppies crawl through that loose stool and they end up ingesting it. So they can end up with coccidia, giardia, some of these things really young. So a stool sample to do an ELISA test and a flotation is a good idea if you're having puppy, puppy problems with diarrhea. Don't just willy-nilly start putting dogs on antibiotics. If you have a puppy with diarrhea, the Puppy Light, which is our electrolyte formula, is a great product. You can tube feed it. You can bottle feed it. It's a chicken soup-based product, and it has the electrolytes in it that will help support that puppy. Sometimes cutting the milk by 50% with Puppy Light for a feeding or two will cut down on the amount of calories that the take, puppy's taking in while keeping them hydrated. So you can cut down on diarrhea without using any drugs. I also use a lot of baby rice cereal, the Gerber product that comes as flakes. The Gerber stage two chicken baby food. It's just straight chicken and water and yogurt. Those are really nice. You can mix those three together, the baby rice cereal, the chicken baby food, and some yogurt. You can mix those together into a paste that you can syringe into the puppies. And that rice cereal and chicken is highly digestible and it can really cut down on diarrhea. You do not routinely want to use antibiotics on puppies with diarrhea and metronidazole should not be used on very young puppies. It will cross the blood-brain barrier until they're about six weeks old, and they can end up with neurologic disease um, problems such as seizures. So do not be putting metronidazole into our babies. Now, if you have puppies with really, really nasty diarrhea, you can sometimes give plasma. Now, plasma, we typically don't think is absorbed after the first 12 to 24 hours after birth. So from a perspective of giving the puppy immunity in their system, they're not going to absorb it. They're going to digest it as a protein. But there's studies done in calves. Again, we get back to the bovine industry because there's a lot more studies on calves than there are on puppies that show that you can get local immunity by giving that plasma through a feeding tube. Excuse me. I had a client that called and asked if they could give it through a bottle. And I'm like, I don't think they'll take it, but Feeding tubes are how we usually give our plasma. Now, if you have puppies that are really gassy that, that also have diarrhea, you can buy infant drops. They're a cymethicone drop. Uh, you can buy them at um, online. You can buy them at Walmart. That and a probiotic should get your puppies back on track. If you have the opposite problem, if you have constipation, Either Cairo syrup or Eagle brand sweetened condensed milk, which at some stores like Walmart comes in a bag so it's easy to reseal, that glucose content is high enough in the, in the um, formula that it will help loosen up their stools. <clears throat> so taking their temperature with a well-lubricated thermometer and giving an enema with ivory soap can help with constipation. Constipation isn't common. It's much more common to see diarrhea, but sometimes you need to do this. This is a red rubber feeding tube. And um, it's got attached uh, to a syringe. It's got soapy water with ivory soap in the water. And you can simply slide the tube in and give the little enema. We actually have this video on our website. So you can see that that's breaking up that fecal, fecal material and helping that puppy to pass stool. I would wear gloves. Um, I should have worn gloves during this video. That's my video, but shame on me. So it's pretty simple. Just lubricate the tube, slide it in, and then gently uh, put in some of the warm water with ivory soap in it. Please, please, please use ivory soap. Do not use fleet enemas. There's a lot of phosphorus in those, and puppies can absorb too much phosphorus to their intestinal tract. 
Additionally, if you have a puppy that you're not sure if it's passing a stool, make sure that you've put in a thermometer with lubricant on it like Vaseline and making sure that the puppy actually has an open rectum. Again, this is not a common defect, but it is a defect we see a couple times a year where the puppy is born without a rectum or without a patent rectum. Um, so be aware that that can be the case. Moving on, metabolic blood testing. So puppies can be blood tested. And I think it's important that your vet uh, has access to this. The equipment that we have now requires tiny, tiny samples of blood. So it's not difficult to get a couple of drops of blood from the foot pad of a puppy um, using a lancet or with a, a jugular stick. And the equipment that we have at our veterinary hospital is used just a couple drops of blood. So we can get a CBC and a chemistry panel on these little kids if we need to. Uh, it's important that you know that liver function tests are always low on our young puppies because they don't have fully developed liver enzymes. If they have an elevated bile acid, that would suggest a liver shunt. Again, that's a common defect, but relatively uncommon even at that. But that's a simple test to run even on a really young puppy. I've seen puppies as early as two weeks of age that we were able to diagnose with a shunt with a blood test. If you're putting your puppy on antibiotics or your vet is putting them on an antibiotic or other drugs, you need to be careful how you select the drugs and how you dose the drugs because drugs metabolized through the liver or excreted through the liver are not gonna be excreted as well. So they can build up to toxic levels in the body fairly quickly. So important to calculate those doses carefully. And then the ALKFOS is always high in neonates because they have a lot of bone growth. That is not a liver specific enzyme. It is an enzyme that goes up with liver disease, but it can go up with arthritis. It can go up with pancreatitis. It can go up with bone growth. So an ALKFOS elevation should not be a reason for concern, but an ALT, which is another liver enzyme should be normal. Kidney tests are a little high, usually at the beginning. It's easy to collect urine. We just showed you how to do that a few slides ago. And the urine should be very pale and very dilute. And if you're checking with a um, specific gravity, uh, then it should be 1.006 to 1.07. That will help us with hydration, but you can check based on urine color at home on a cotton ball or a wet, or I'm sorry, a dry tissue. And then it's not uncommon to see a little protein and a little glucose in the urine until the puppies are six weeks old because their kidneys aren't fully developed yet. Now there's a test frequently done on the IDEX panels called an SDMA. It's a really nice test for de uh, determining if there is early sign of kidney failure. However, until the dogs are mature, till their kidney function is matured around six to 12 months of age, it's not reliable. So if you have a dog that goes in for a spay and it comes back with an elevated SDMA, don't get excited. Just ask your vet to call IDEX and talk to them about what those results mean. Now, glucoses are really easy to run. You can run them at home if you need to. You can run them at the vet clinic. There is a device called a PET test. It's made for dogs. It's the same kind of glucometer that they use for people with diabetes. The glucose should be over 90. And so if you have a weak puppy or a puppy that's having seizures, um, it's relatively easy to collect the blood. You need a lancet, which is how you poke the puppy's foot. You need a test strip and you need the equipment to do this. So it's three pieces. And again, um, this is something that you can pretty easily do with a glucometer at home if you have a diabetic family member. Um, this puppy came into our practice, it's normal, um, but we just poke the bottom of the foot, get one little drop of blood, put it on the test strip, and in 30 seconds, less than 30 seconds, we have a result and this puppy's glucose is 139. So this kid's getting enough to eat, there's no concern. This was a normal puppy, we were just demonstrating how to do the test but it's simple for you to do. It came back at 139. So if you have puppies, especially the toy breeds that tend to get low glucose hypoglycemia, this is a test that you can run very easily at home. The pet test is under $50. Um, so it might be something to consider having at home for testing. The urogenital system, which is the bladder and the uh, genitals, we should see testicles descended by the time the puppy is at birth, but you usually cannot find them until they're between four and seven weeks of age. You should feel too. If you only feel the right one, it's unlikely that the other one is gonna come down because it has a shorter distance to go. So the left one should always be down before the right if you're only feeling one. Now, balanopostitis is really common and really normal. That's that little yellow, gooey, green, sticky stuff at the tip of the prepuce where the puppy's penis comes out. Do not get excited about that. Do not put the puppy on antibiotics, clean it up, but do not start antibiotics for this. Urinary obstructions can occur in male puppies. They are pretty rare. 
but they can occur. So if you see a puppy that's straining and you're not sure if it's defecating or urinating, you may have to go to the vet and have it checked. But if you use your cotton ball trick and the puppy can urinate, then you don't have a urinary obstruction. Just be aware that they, those can happen pretty young and they're pretty devastating to the puppies. On the girl side, it's normal to have a nice normal vulva, which you can see in the picture on the right. Oftentimes before a heat cycle, we'll see what's a recessed or an inverted vulva, very common, not anything to be excited about, but a heat cycle will typically create the hormonal changes that it takes to make that a more normal shape and normal exposure to the vulva. So this is why we do not recommend spaying female puppies, especially if they have an inverted vulva until they've had their first heat cycle. Unfortunately, there are veterinarians who are really happy to spay very young and then go to surgery and fix this recessed vulva. So now you've paid for two, maybe three surgeries to get this fixed. So it's really important that you include in your contracts with people that are buying your puppies, that if they have a recessed or inverted vulva, that you give them the opportunity to have a heat cycle before they're spayed. Now, there's also, again, a not common condition called an os clitoris. It's the comparable female version of an Oz penis. Now, all male puppies should have a bone in their penis. That's absolutely normal. It's called an Oz penis. If it's in the female, it's called an Oz clitoris. That is not a normal structure. You can see this dog has some pretty significant urine scalding and that protruding tissue has a bone in it. This is a dog that probably is going to need a surgical correction. These again are not common, but they happen. So it's something to be aware of. And if it does occur, you probably don't want to repeat that breeding. Next, I want to talk about the body wall. I want to make sure that you remember that umbilical cords are normal, but when they are born, you should be cutting and tying the cord if the bitch hasn't taken care of that for you, and then dipping the cord at birth at two hours, eight hours, and then twice a day until the cord falls off. And we have this really nice product called Clean Cut. It is meant to be used for one litter and then the bottle discarded. It is not meant to be used on multiple litters. It's a small volume. It's about the smallest volume we could put together. And this kind of gelatinous material in here does a really nice job of staying on the cord. Additionally, when you go into the vet or when you're checking your puppy, you should be checking for umbilical hernias, which are the ones at the belly button, and inguinal hernias, which are the ones in the groin region. Um, those you can see on all breeds of puppies. It's not specific to your breed. For dipping the cord, when I say I mean dip the cord, I really do mean dip the cord. I really do mean put the cord in the bottle and then dip the puppy over and make sure that you've completely covered the cord in this betadine. That will help the cord to dry up and fall off before it becomes infected. I have personally lost a puppy to that. Don't let that happen to you. Now, we can sometimes see open abdominal walls. There are two versions of it. There's an omphacele and a gastroschisis. One is on the midline, one is off the midline. Uh, one has an intact intestinal tract, one does not. So sometimes you can put these puppies back together, especially if they're born by C-section at the vet clinic or you recognize it fast before the bitch bites that off. Um, this particular puppy we corrected but did not survive, but many times they do. So if you find this happening, then you wanna get to your vet as soon as possible and see if they can help you with a surgical correction of that. Um, but don't let the bitch lick at this. If you're seeing that, that was not caused by the bitch. This was a birth defect. We do see these in humans as well. So it is not caused by licking at the cord or pulling too hard. This is a genetic defect. Now, I want you to take a look at this little puppy because this is part of my body well discussion. He's propped up on this little headrest. It's the headrest you put on kids. You can see when he's sleeping, he's sleeping here. He's twitching. That's normal behavior. But I want you to look at his breathing pattern. And even propped up, he's breathing really hard. And I'm going to tell you this puppy is not a normal puppy. He does have a flat chest. There are multiple kinds of flat chests that we identify in dogs. Not very well identified, but we do know that there's multiple kinds. I'm going to stand up for one second because I forgot to bring this over next to me. Um, in these cases where you have a singleton puppy that's very large or a puppy or two that's really large or a puppy with pectus excavatum, which is what that chest wall defect is called when their chest doesn't have a normal shape to it and it's caved in on the, the sternum and the underside. Um, using this kind of a toy like this little octopus guy here um, can be like super helpful. He's got these fun little legs. I'm out of focus. Um, these fun little legs. And you can put these guys right in the incubator with your puppies. And this is one of my own personal puppies. You can see she was all over it. She really liked having, she was a singleton. 
she really liked having a uh, buddy in the box with her and she was able to crawl up and down off of this um, little octopus so that it kept her from becoming flat. You can also use egg crate mattresses in the bottom of your whelping box, but um, sometimes those are harder to keep clean. This octopus just goes in the wash and then you've always got a clean octopus for this little kid to lay on it. I don't know why these legs on the octopus work so well. They're really meant to be a dog chew toy. They're not meant to prevent flat chests, but I learned this from a client and they work beautifully. The other things I do want to mention briefly about a singleton puppy is they tend to be spoiled puppies. They're spoiled by you because it's the only puppy you have in the litter. They're spoiled by their mother because they have nothing to do other than dote on this one puppy. And some of these puppies grow up a little different than their um they would be if they were raised with a litter. They don't have the feel of touch and they don't have the feel of frustration. I learned this again from my own personal firsthand experience. And I had a behaviorist that worked with us on a puppy of ours that um, was aggressive, not just play biting, but aggressively aggressive by the time he was about eight weeks old because he was a singleton and I didn't raise him correctly. So what you need to know is they should feel a touch. So you should take a stuffed animal like your little octopus several times a day and push him off the nipple so he's frustrated. And so he feels the touch of someone else against them so that they have that feel of frustration, that feel of competition. And it's really important to do that. I can oftentimes tell if we have a singleton puppy in the exam room uh, when they come in at their eight or 10 week visit because they do act different. So be sure that you're doing those things with your singleton puppies. A lot of you have singletons if you have toy breeds. Um, so just be aware that you can prevent some of those behavioral issues if you're on top of it when they're very young, like starting at a day of age. Uh, the other thing I do with my singletons is I will take a sock, an old sock, and stuff it with either beans or rice, and probably two of them, one on each side, because when puppies are nursing and they have a whole row of little puppies and they're nursing on their mom, they have other puppies against which to lean when they're nursing. If they're singleton, they spend their entire amount of energy just holding onto the nipple so that they don't roll side to side. So having those little stuffed um, bean or rice socks can be helpful. You can warm those in the microwave so you're not putting some cold surface against the puppy. And then it helps to support them so that they're really able to focus their concentration and their effort and their calorie use on getting calories by nursing and not by keeping themselves from rolling side to side. So it's really helpful. And then we do carry this snuggle puppy, which is kind of fun because it has this heat pack in it that you can microwave. And then it's got the little simulated heartbeat. So you can put this in the whelping box with your singleton and it feels like it's got somebody else in the box with it. Singletons, I think, sometimes feel like they're just abandoned and they kind of give up. So we got to work extra hard on these little singleton guys to keep them going. Hearts. Now, before you sell a puppy, I think it's really important that a veterinarian listens to the heart of these puppies before they leave your your kennel or your home. It's important that you're not selling a puppy with a murmur. Now, it's easy for you to find a lot of defects. You can tell if they have testicles. You can tell if they have hernias. You can tell what their bites are. A lot of you are very skilled at looking at your puppies, but listening to the heart can be a little bit of a challenge if you're not a professional in the medical field. So you'll want to be able to distinguish between a soft, quiet murmur that's probably not serious. It's innocent. It's functional. It's physiologic, and it'll go away by 12 weeks versus a serious heart murmur. You don't want to sell a puppy with a serious heart murmur because that puppy may end up needing some significant medical interventions. And then you've gotten somebody that's either going to come back to you for money or you've broken their heart. And nobody wants to have that as their reputation out in the field selling puppies. Why do our puppies have heart murmurs when they're young that they outgrow? Number one is they're always anemic. So oftentimes there's more turbulence in the blood. And that's what we hear with a murmur is turbulence. Sometimes they're stressed. It can be associated with fever. It can be associated with an infection. And puppies always have low proteins as well. So they just don't have the same amount of viscosity or, or um, thickness to the blood. So when they're very young, you will sometimes hear murmurs. Sometimes if the vet holds the puppy right against the stethoscope, instead of standing the puppy on the table and putting the stethoscope across their chest, they'll pick up a heart murmur because they've changed the shape of the rib cage and caused a murmur. More common in kittens, but it can happen in puppies as well. So if they hear a loud murmur, make sure that you have that checked out. Eyes and ears. They should have two of each. I know that seems obvious. Um, the eyelids should open between 10 and 14 days. The cornea should be cloudy in the first 24 hours after opening. And in the first three weeks, they don't see very well. In the first two weeks, they still have reflex. They can still see light through their eyelids. But 
for the first week, they're not going to see very well. That's normal. If you have puppies with a swelling of the eyelids before the eyelids open, this is a true emergency. The veterinary ophthalmologists all make me talk about this because it's super important that you get these eyelids open. They should be treated with both an oral antibiotic like Clavamox and a topical antibiotic. And it can be almost any topical antibiotic as long as it's one without a steroid in it. You can see the character of this discharge is pretty disgusting. And um, it is important that you get the eyelids open. If you have a vet that's willing to do this, great. If you have a vet that can't or it's a weekend, um, this is a hemostat, not a pair of scissors, just to be perfectly clear. You want to put a warm compress on and then use some gauze, perhaps a hemostat. And then with a little bit of gentle pressure, you can um, get the eyelid to open. This litter of puppies had out of the um, eight puppies in the litter, most of them had at least one eye with a problem. Now, if you read the literature, it says this happens in unclean conditions. In my experience, it's typically been a very, very, very clean household with a very, very, very fastidious owner, but it just happened that there were bacteria in the environment from something like metritis or mastitis that the bitch had. So you should not feel bad about it. It happens. It's not because your kennel is dirty, but you should get these eyelids open. If you don't, these puppies end up with vision loss. I've seen blind puppies. I've seen some very beautiful blind puppies. So do not let that happen to you. If you see swelling, even if it's one eyelid set, open them all. You will not cause vision damage by opening them early. You will save vision on your puppies. The ears, again, they should have two. I know that seems obvious, but we've had multiple dogs come in that only have one ear canal. They may have both flaps, but they may not have a canal. So look and make sure that they have ear canals. They open at 10 to 14 days, and there is a, a hearing test that can be done. It's called a BEAR test. It stands for Brain Auditory. Um, this is one of my little farm dogs, and this is my staff during COVID doing a hearing test with our a doctor that's trained on doing this. And essentially, they put little electrodes in the puppy's scalp, and uh, you can tell after six weeks of age, you can't do it before six weeks because they can be born with hearing and lose it if they have the genetics to do that. And it, it is complicated. It's frequently associated with a white coat, which is why I chest my farm dogs, but we know Dalmatians, English setters, bulldogs, a lot of the white coated dogs and cats can have deafness. <clears throat> so there's a hearing test that can be done. There's usually several veterinarians in every state that do it. So if you have a white breed, you may want to find a veterinarian that can do this. Clapping your hands or dropping your keys behind the puppy, not a hearing test. Limbs, they should have four. They should have four normal limbs. Um, this is not probably the greatest picture that we have, but you can see this is a little bulldog and he has back feet that are rotated. And I have seen a number of these puppies born that are born with their feet rotated almost to the point that their foot pads are pointing the wrong direction. But within two or three days, their legs are rotated back and the feet are going the right, dire right direction. Do not euthanize these puppies. Do not get excited about it. Just realize that this is not uncommon. A lot of people will do some massage and some physical therapy kind of flexing and extending the legs. I've been told by the bulldog people that puppies born with this kind of a rear have the best rear. That's a matter of personal preference, but um, do not give up on these guys because they will frequently self-correct. Syringe feeding, very important that you have the ability to syringe or tube feed. Um, just wanted to throw this in so that you don't forget that you can syringe feed. This puppy is, you can see, sucking pretty hard on the nipple. So she's um, not pushing hard on the plunger. The puppy's doing most of the work. This is being uh, fed with a miracle nipple. So if the puppy's temperature is 96 or above and the puppy's not getting enough nursing at the nipple for whatever reason, whether mom can't do it or whatever happens, make sure that you're feeding these guys. We do have a whole um, video on the Learning Center about how to tube feed. We're going to not go through that today. But I do want you to remember that syringe and tube feeding is a very, very important tool if you have puppies that are not gaining the way that they should be. What is ENS? ENS is the super dog program. It was popularized by Carmen Battaglia. Um, it does create stronger cardiovascular performance, stronger heartbeats, stronger adrenal glands, more tolerance to stress, and greater resistance to disease. What the heck is it? Well, it's a series of five exercises. Some people have thrown in a sixth one where they let them have a variety of different smells just for variety. So it takes 30 seconds or less a day per puppy. You do it once a day from day three to day 16 after birth. Uh, step one is holding the head directly above their hips. So you count to five, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. Step two is to hold the puppy head down, not swing it, but just to steady, steadily move it head down, hold it for five seconds. 
The next step is to hold the puppy on the back for five seconds. The step after that is to put the puppy on a cold, wet towel, or in the case of my husband, a Mountain Dew can, because he doesn't want to go get a cold, wet towel, but he always has an empty can of Mountain Dew with him, or a full can, I should say. And then tactile stimulation on the bottom of the foot with a Q-tip. So it's five steps. Um, it's very simple to do. This is my whelping box, my litter. So we're going to do 1,001, 1,002, 1,004, five, 3, 1,004, 1,005, then five upside down. Not so happy. Five seconds. Five seconds on her back. Five seconds tickling the bottom of the foot. And then the towel that's in front of the bitch is a cold, wet towel. So she goes on there for five seconds. Simple, easy to do. I've had lots of kids that are really great at doing this for their family's breeding program. And I will tell you, it makes a huge difference in this puppy's ability to tolerate things um, as they grow up, the veterinary visits, um, their socialization, their social skills are much better. It's super easy. And the people that start doing this absolutely positively swear by it as far as being a, a really lovely way to improve our puppy's social skills. So Shelly and Tom put together for you today some great little uh, tidbits to have. So you've got your puppy toy, toy bundle uh, for puppies that need some activities. You've got the puppy comfort bundle, including our little snuggle puppy. We've got the nurture mate for the uh, probiotic and the puppy light for the electrolytes. Then we have our Breeders Edge newborn bundle, which includes some of those products, including the foster care formula. Our buddy system, which is our microchip system with all kinds of really cool stuff coming soon. And then the puppy health bundle. So there's some really great stuff here. If you are putting together your whelping supply and equipment list, here is your list of shopping. Um, we do have a, a whelping kit on the website, so you can very easily um, find that by scanning the QR code. And then we have our drug and medication list. Some of these do require prescriptions, most do not. Um, the oxygen concentrator and incubator from Puppy Warmer, great products, so take a look at those. Um, Dopram is a prescription item, uh, plasma, vitamin K, some of these do require veterinary intervention. Most of them do not. So really important stuff to have. And I think we have a few minutes for Q&A before we close. Yes, we absolutely do. And we have a lot of questions. So we'll get through as many as we can here. Um, if we don't get to your question today, we encourage you to call our pet care pros. Um, you can give them a call and they can get your question answered or reach out to Dr. Greer as well. But let's see how many of these we can get through. Um, real quick, Julie's wondering just how long are they considered neonates? You use that term a lot. How long are they considered neonates? Oh yeah, that's a that's a good question. Most people think that they're neonates until they're about six weeks old. Um, and then they enter the pediatric period. Okay. Um, somebody says they had a golden puppy that had milk coming out of its nose, but no cleft palate. They said this lasted until it went to hard food. Now the pup seems fine. They're wondering, what do you think could cause that? The puppy was trying to nurse too fast. Usually they're gulping down milk and they're just not swallowing it quickly enough, but always check for a cleft. Okay. Um, Somebody's wondering um, about the Duke claws. Should that be clipped if they're not sticking out? They have a, a King Charles. Yeah, you need to keep those clipped. Um, most of the time, th there's a lot of people who are not removing Duke claws surgically anymore. Uh, some of the breeds that we're doing tails on, they're still doing, some are not. My corgis, we still take them off. My farm dogs, we don't. So there's a lot of variation out there. Um, so some people take them off at three to five days of age. Other people leave them on. But if they are left on, you must keep them trimmed so that they don't end up growing and causing problems into the foot pad. Okay. Uh, Karen's wondering, is folic acid appropriate to help prevent the cleft palate? And what do you recommend for that? Yes, it's I do recommend folic acid, especially if you have a brachycephalic breed or a breed that's predisposed to it. Um, we have a lot of information in the learning center on our um, brood bitches. So that's a good place to look. The only published dose for folic acid is a five milligram per dog per day dose, which is a huge amount. Um, the capsules are usually about 400 micrograms. So that would be 12 of those a day. Most people are not going to give 12. Um, but many of our supplements that we have at Revival for our bitches like um, Oxymama and Oxymate, or I'm sorry, Oxymate will have folic acid in it. So take a look at those products or you can buy the, the human products as well. Correct. Yeah. The Breeder's Edge Oxymate is a prenatal for dogs. So <laughs> you got it right exactly. there. Perfect. Um, so Heather is wondering, should the puppy be on Breeders Edge Nurture Flora if mom is on antibiotics for mastitis? Yes. 
Okay. Um, somebody is wondering about uh, canine herpes presence and the percent found and does the puppy get it if the mom has an outbreak? The answer is probably yes, the puppy will get it. It can be so severe that the puppy dies in utero. Um, it can be something that's contagious to the puppies up till three weeks of age. So herpes is typically thought of as an upper respiratory disease in the adult dog that does not cause serious disease, but in the puppy, um, either prior to birth or shortly after birth can be a fatal disease. So there's really not a good treatment for it. Treatment essentially is keeping the puppies ultra warm at 98 to, to 100 degrees rectal and administering plasma um, with the hopes of overcoming the herpes virus. It's a tough disease. Okay. Um, someone's wondering just kind of some signs to know if a puppy is constipated. Um, yeah, that's good. A good question. And typically you'll see a puppy that's straining to defecate. Uh, if you're not sure, just stimulate the rectum and typically a puppy will pass some stool and problem solved. If they're, if they're having normal stools and they're passing when you stimulate them or the bitch licks them, you should be good. It's not common, but you'll usually know that they don't eat well. They just feel they, they look kind of distended and kind of bloated and yeah, they're just, they're just not quite right. Uh, Julie's wondering, do you recommend dosing or doing liver glucose and kidney testing on all neonates or what would be the reason you would run these specific tests? If I had a, a, a puppy that was sick, that wasn't doing well. Now, bile acids are routinely done on Irish wolfhounds before they typically go to their new homes. So if you have an Irish wolfhound or a line of dogs that might have a problem with liver shunts, then it would be routine. It is not routine. It is mostly if you have a puppy that's not doing well that you would have those blood tests done. Uh, Connie is wondering, is there any way to avoid umbilical hernias? She says they're kind of normal in the, the breeds they have. They have banshees. <laughs> the, only, the only way to avoid them is to not breed them. Okay. That's a problem. <laughs> No, it's genetic. I don't care what anybody says. They want to tell you that it's not a genetic concern. It's genetic. There are some breeds that it's just so common and we almost expect to see it. Um, Bernie's Mountain Dogs are certainly one of them. It's really common. All you can do is try to avoid breeding parents that both have it, but unfortunately it's pretty common and it's not a fatal disease. It does not lead to omphacele or gastroschisis in its worst form. Those are completely separate defects. Stephanie's wondering if there's a cleft lip puppy in the litter, is it possible that that will happen again? And should the breeding not be repeated? Will it affect the litter mate's genetics? What do you recommend there? Yeah, the litter mate may carry the genetics for it. So you probably want to think hard about it. Now, the rule of thumb that I have been taught by a geneticist at UPenn was, because I had one litter of my own that had three out of eight puppies with clefts. And she said that was so many puppies in the litter. It probably wasn't genetic. It was probably due to some environmental influence. So I don't throw them all out, but you want to be very thoughtful about whether that's a dog that should be in a breeding program or not, because it may be genetic. It may not be when it's that high a percentage. If it's one puppy, it's probably genetic. And you probably should think really hard about whether that's a breeding that you want to repeat. Um, someone's wondering, at what point do you start bottle feeding if you're not sure about how much milk mom is producing? If the puppy's not gaining weight and their urine is dark, bottle or tube feed. If they're gaining at, um, if they're doubling their birth weight in the first seven to 10 days, their urine is pale, they're gaining, they're happy, they're healthy, they're doing well, I don't intervene. But you can always stick a bottle in their mouth and see. And if they're hungry, they'll probably take it. And if they're not hungry, they probably won't. What many people are concerned about is that if I supplement feed, that I'm then going to suppress the puppy's likelihood to go over and want a nurse. And the answer I have for you is, do you go to Thanksgiving dinner? When you finish dinner at Thanksgiving, do you push back from the table and then come back for a piece of pie? Because you're full, you're going to eat anyway. So you're not going to suppress the puppy's likelihood to want a nurse because nursing is not just a functional behavior of getting calories. It's also a social behavior. So I don't think you're going to suppress a puppy's willingness to nurse. I watch weight, I watch urine color, and I make the decision based on that. Okay. We have time for like two more questions here. Um, Margaret says they have a constipated puppy that's about five days old. It's nursing well. Um, it's a C-section singleton and mom had just begun to clean it. They have been stimulating and used a warm water enema, but what else can they do since it is constipated? 
another warm water enema and some Cairo syrup. Cairo or Eagle Brown condensed milk, like I said, has a high enough glucose level. It'll cause osmotic diarrhea. So you don't want it to end up with diarrhea, but you do want to give up, you know, it depends on what size the dog is. I don't know if it's a four ounce puppy or a two pound puppy, but a CC of Cairo syrup may be enough to help and not have to give any drugs or any more enemas. Okay. And Stephanie's just wondering why is the temperature important when feeding them? Why do you need to know that temperature? Sure. So a puppy below 96 degrees rectally Fahrenheit will not have normal GI motility. The gut will have what's called ileus. It'll just sit there and be static. And when that happens, then the milk foams up in the stomach and then the puppy starts to aspirate and gag on the milk and end up with aspiration pneumonia. So having a chilled puppy that you're feeding is dangerous. And uh, just kind of a follow-up with that, somebody's just kind of, what is your recommendation for milk replacer, puppy formula, if that is needed? Yeah, my favorite two are the foster care that we carry at Revival and Esbalat goat's milk-based product. Those are the two I use. I never use a homemade formula. They're not going to have the amino acids and the fatty acids. I don't use goat's milk. The fat and the protein contents aren't correct. You want to use a commercially available canine milk replacer. And those are my two favorites, foster care and Esbalac milk, goat's milk. Okay. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Greer. We appreciate your time today. Um, If you do have more questions, again, check out the Revival Learning Center. We have lots of resources there. Um, Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. We have all of these uh, information, the webinars, the articles, the videos that Dr. Greer does um, will be shared there as well. So we encourage you to um, use those resources. And of course, call our pet care pros. They are always here to help and answer your questions. Thanks again for joining us. I'm Shelly with the Revival Education Team. Thank you, Dr. Greer, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Hi, if you're watching on YouTube, consider subscribing to the Revival Animal Health YouTube channel. If you have a pet health question, call our pet care pros at this number, and don't miss our other pet health videos.